Genesis chapter 9, and as you turn there, I, let, me, let me just say something that I think is in probably the back of a lot of people's minds. And um, I've, I've been preaching sort of in this direction, and some of the things I've done on Pastor Mike Online um, have been an effort to, I guess, awaken people to uh, what's going on. Um, sometimes I, sometimes I, I just get tired of the doom and the gloom stuff. My wife, is. she goes through Facebook usually on the way over every morning. And this morning, she slammed her phone down. She said, I'm sick of Facebook. Why? It's nonstop, the nonsense, the racist rants, the terror, the destruction, the rioting. And um, this is what vexation looks like. Okay? Vexation, that word's in the Bible, study it. Anything vex, vexing, vexation, it's, it's fingernails on the chalkboard is what it is. It is, an, it is an effort to alter the course of the world. America is the single most important country in the world. Now, is that, is that some kind of... American pride that's making me say that, if you think about it, the world gets protected by this country, okay? A lot of policy in, around the world centers around America. A lot of economies around the world are based upon what currency? The dollar. And as America goes, the world will go. So I believe then that our nation is a battleground of ideologies. And the, the guy that I put on the screen this morning who obviously hates God, and I, did, you didn't, I covered up a portion of that guy's t-shirt. It was not only the word, but a picture. And it was awful. Okay, and this guy's proud of this. There is a very anti-Christian sentiment and anti-Christian spirit over this nation. It's already happened in Canada. Preachers have already had their mouths shut, stapled shut. They cannot say certain things against certain types of people, sodomites. Or get them in a lot of trouble. So do we want that in America? I don't. I don't want that. Okay? But a significant number of very evil people do. And, you know, the fact that it's not letting up tells me that they intend to keep all of this violence, this hatred... Um, and everything they're doing through the month of November. Why November? That's the election. And it's already been said by a significant number of very important people, John Kerry's one of them, that they will not allow the president to be reelected. Now, hold on a second. This is America. If we vote for him, he's the president, right? Huh? Supposed to be. But I will tell you that some lower ranking people in the FBI, CIA, Department of Justice, other places are all going to jail now for things they did during the Obama, Bush, Clinton years. Bad things. One of the key, one of the key witnesses in the Mueller investigation against Donald Trump just got 10 years for child trafficking. 
Okay? How many other people working inside the United States government have participated in trafficking children? How many would you think? We're finding out there's, a, there's some very dirty closets being opened. And those people don't want those closet doors open. They killed Jeffrey Epstein because they got him in jail. There's no way he hung himself. Not a chance. He was murdered because of what he knew and what he was going to say. There are people below him who are singing like birds, testifying of the crimes that people have committed. And the prospect of any of these high-ranking elected and non-elected people, the prospect of them going to prison is very real. And they won't have that. And they have the power and the ability to create as much problems in this country in order to cause such division and chaos that we're focused on trying to stay alive rather than putting them in prison where they belong. Now, November 3rd is the election. And I absolutely believe that it doesn't matter who CNN and NBC projects wins the election. There's going to be a fight afterward. Okay? Hate to say it. Hate to even think it. But I believe the spirit is there. The spirit is there to do it. And um, so I would, I would tell everybody. I would tell. I'm the watchman, right? It means I'm looking out. I'm on a high place. And I'm trying to see as far away from the city as I can because the earlier warning that I give you, the better off everybody's going to be. If I wait till they're at the door and then go, boo, 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 what have I done? I've accomplished nothing. They're at the door. So I think I have to at least let everybody know, hey, I don't see the enemy coming yet, but I've heard that they're coming. And I think it's wise to be on your knees a lot. And I, I say that, when I say on your knees, you ought to literally try that. There's been times when I would hear something going on and it would trouble me so bad, I would go literally in my, in my bedroom or in my office, shut my door, get on my knees and start praying right then and there. And I've seen God do some wonderful things that way. So it's just, a, it's just a watchman telling the people the sword is coming. Sword is coming to the land. And I think we have to be warned and I think we have to be ready. I'm, I may talk about getting armed later, but right now I, I think it just suffices. We all know what to do. Pray, study this book, get some wisdom, get some wisdom, okay? Genesis chapter 9, uh, this is something, I, I didn't touch on this last Sunday night because I kind of went over the unfinished portion of last Sunday morning sermon, but there's something that stands out here that God has done, and we'll read, this, we'll read Genesis 9, 1 through 3, and then we'll pray. Uh, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Um, so, I mean, he's going to bless all the trees, all the grass, all the animals that leave the ark. He's going to bless Noah and all his sons. They're all going to have a bunch of babies. They're going to re basically fill the entire earth again with plenty of things to eat for both kinds, whether you're carnivore, vegivore, whatever. And God's going to bless this earth with life. And the fear of you, and look, look at this, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Now, how many different creatures did he mention there? Four. There's a reason why. 
Into your hand are they delivered. And I have still yet to go to the lake and have a fish jump right in my hand. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So now for the first time, God is saying to mankind, I'm now giving you the, the blessing to not only eat the fruit, the vegetables, the grain that grows on the earth, but I'm also giving you the benefit to eat pork, chicken, deer, beef, goat, rabbit, squirrel, raccoon, possum. All that stuff. Who's had possum before? Anybody had possum? Sterling, had, you've had possum. What does it taste like? Never had possum. Appreciate that. This is why he's the head deacon and chief elder of our church. Do what? Yeah. Uh, we, the, the church we had, it was out in the country, out in Rich Woods. And a bunch of old boys in that church, and I'd ask them, did you, you know, did you ever eat possum? And old Junior Lewis, he said, yeah, we used to eat raccoon all the time. He said, boy, it's greasy. Boy, it's greasy. But he said, that was pretty good. We used to go coon hunting all day. He said, you'll have to go coon hunting with us. And I said, yeah, I look forward to that. So anyway, but now God is giving man, this is, this is a dietary change. We're told that our appendix was one of those things that when we ate a lot of grains, we used, but since we don't eat a lot of grains anymore, we don't need it anymore. That's what I've heard. Because God changed the dietary things after the flood. He gives man now the blessing to eat animals, fish, fowl of the air, beast of the earth, so on, and everything that moveth upon the earth, so on and so on. We're, we're being given the blessing to eat them. And I want you to ponder that and think about this. Let's go to prayer. Father, it's a joy to be in your house. Thank you for these people. Uh, both here and online, and those that are listening late in the evening in Turkana and Samburu, and Lord, literally around the world. Uh, Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to share your word with these people. And I pray, dear God, that you give me wisdom. And I don't think I'm the only one that has it. I know your people around the world, they read this Bible just like I do. And they may see something a little differently than I do, but that's okay. We're all made of the same book, same words, and we're the same people. And I pray, dear God, that you'd bless your word. Give us, give us the meat of the word tonight. Give us understanding. Let us see what this is about and what you intend out of this. So, Father, we love you and we trust you. And we ask for your blessings on your word tonight. And, Father, we, for our country, God, please show us what you want us to do, how you want us to act, how you want us to respond. Show us, Father, how to fight this war. We're already fighting it. We're fighting it on our knees. And Father, in that way, we'll never lose. Never, never lose. So bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. So, I mean, it is. It is, an, it is a concept that we all well know that it doesn't matter. Um, there, are, there are places in this country still that you can go to hunt and there's a possibility that some of the animals you'll see like mountain goats and things like that, they've never seen a human being in their life. And yet, just the image of a human, they know immediately there's a fear in them of, of humans. God instilled it in them. It's written into their, I guess their DNA. Somehow, some way, when an animal is confronted with a human being, it is in their nature to run. We don't, they're not easy to catch. They're not easy to just walk up to and grab them by the throat. While, whereas animals will live in the neighborhood of other animals. They coexist in the forest or in the wilderness or wherever and may not be afraid of each other. When a human comes into the, in the presence, they immediately scatter. It's, it's an absolute thing. My dad taught me this about catfish. I used to play around the 
rocks there at the Arkansas River, Mississippi River, where Dad would try to catfish. And Dad would say, would you sit down? The fish know you're here. And I thought he's crazy. You're making that up. They can't see me here. The water is muddy for crying out loud. I didn't realize that they sense the presence of a human. I don't know if it, they feel the vibration or what of it is. But if I was dancing around them rocks, Dad wouldn't catch no catfish. Sit down so I can catch something. And he, but he's right. So what does that mean for us? Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Let's, let's take this and apply it in a spiritual way. I love... The, I love the teaching of this. I love seeing it in the Bible. I love what it means. Because understand then, the, the whole spiritual world around us, we don't see it. Sometimes we don't really pay attention to its presence or sometimes we don't even understand the presence. But there are spirits everywhere, both good and bad. There was a couple books came out back in the 90s. The first one was called This Present Darkness. Second one was called Piercing the Darkness. And they were written in a novel. Do you remember reading those books? Fantastic uh, imagination by the guy. And he's writing, a, he's writing a, a novel about a pastor in a town. And, and I, if, if I remember right, there was something about abortion that was going on there. But anyway... The author was showing you the spirits and how they talked to one another, how they operated, the, the battles that were going on around this town and around the pastor and around the people of this town. It's, I thought it was awesome the way he imagined it all. When you read the Bible, then you understand there is a, always a presence of spiritual entities around us beside us, above us, underneath us. They're always there. And I believe that there is, in some cases, a, a fight, a war going on around you every day. Who in here knows of a situation where you know your life was spared by God somehow, some way? Guarantee you angels were present there. Guarantee you they were. Okay? There was one steering the car that I was asleep at the wheel at in Wyoming. I told you that last week. So look at your Bible. Ezekiel 1 verse 4. Ezekiel's seeing into the spirit world, seeing things I've never seen before. I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, which is like fire, out of the midst of the fire... Understand these, that's what these spirits are made of. That's their substance. We're made of dirt. They're made of fire, literally. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four, notice the phrase, living creatures. John's going to say this, he's going to tell this story, but he's going to tell it a little different. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So we would call them humanoid. The word is humanoid. They had a human-like appearance to them. The shape of a human body. But, verse 6, everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. So that's why that number four, I believe, is in Genesis 9. The four types of creatures that God said man would have dominion over. Now watch this. Everyone had four faces, everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Now this is a man, but it's the feet are not men's feet. They're like a cow, like cattle, calf. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. That's the fire that they're made of. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went, so whatever one was facing north, if they moved north, that's the one that faced north. If they were moving south, they didn't turn to go south. They just went south. They just, and that was the face that faced that direction. Then said verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, 
They four had the face of a man, number one, the face of a lion, number two, on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four also had the face of an eagle. Now, here's what's interesting. Which one's, what's right and what's left? Okay, if they're, if, who, which, which side is facing north and south? I mean, it may not be a big deal to you, but I, I ask questions like that. But I want you to notice that they have an appearance of animals more so than humans. There is some human to it, but by and large, you've got one face of a man and the other three faces, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, those are creatures, those are animals. So now when we look in Revelation 4, turn over there, John's, think of Ezekiel as the left eye seeing it, Revelation is the right eye seeing it. Two different angles of the same place, same thing. You're getting a little bit different description, but overall, you're getting the whole picture by putting the two together. And John doesn't use the phrase living creatures. He uses the phrase beast. Beast. So Revelation 4, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So we have the same description. A man, a lion, an ox or calf, and an eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, here's, here's a simple question. Do these beasts ever stop doing this? What if they decide, you know what, we want a different job. Can we play the trumpets instead of just sitting here going, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which... Can we, can, can we four beasts choose to do something else for God? No. The answer is no. And understand now that the sole purpose for these four creatures is to do this. It's what they do. So I like to think of a whippoorwill. You ever had a whippoorwill outside your house, middle of the night, back in the days when we had to have the windows open because we didn't have air conditioning? What'd they do, Sterling? And how long would they do that? Forever! Shut those blasted things up. Could they choose to do something different? They were beasts. And they were designed and created by God to do this one thing. And they did it perpetually. And this is what you have to understand about the spirits that are around us. Let's, let's focus on the evil ones, the evil spirits. Number one, we know that they do have a certain higher intelligence than, let's say, dogs and cats and lions and eagles down here on this earth, although I'd say eagles are pretty smart. Supposedly, the turkey is the smartest animal in the woods. My dad always taught me that. Mike, turkey is the smartest animal in the woods because they just seem to know when trouble's around. And there's ways that a guy has to disguise himself when he's turkey hunting that you just don't normally have to do when you're deer hunting. Okay, they really got to, I remember my dad had to really cover up his image and his appearance. Why? Because God put it in that turkey to be smart enough to avoid any side of a human. Period. The end. Okay? So, and they had a brain this big, but they were pretty smart at what they did. So think of, think of devils now, number one, as beasts. All of them. All of them are beasts. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in the Bible. Number one, we have here the lion, the eagle, the ox, 
or the, the calf and so on. They have wings, so that's not typical human appearance. But anyway, but they don't alter what they have been assigned to do. God did not give them, Josiah, God did not give them what he gave you. If you're in public and you have an itch in an embarrassing place, you don't scratch it. Right? You can choose that. Does a dog choose when to scratch? Wherever they are, that's what they do. They don't have a choice. God gave us free will. We're not beasts. We're made in the image of Jesus Christ, who chose to come down and obey his Father. Okay? Now, turn to uh, Genesis 3. Here's some examples. This is the devil. The first introduction of the devil into the world is telling us he's not a man like us. He's not a man with a pitchfork and a red suit. He is a serpent, a snake, uh, an adder, a python, or whatever. Now the serpent was more subtle than any what? Beast! Beast of the field. So the question is then, did Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, did he really have a choice when he fell because of his pride? No. He was made by God to do exactly what he did. And he did it. He full and understand this. Even devils fulfill the plan of God. Devils are controlled by God, used by God, just like we use animals. We, before we built machines, we used animals for plowing, for taking care of things, for moving heavy objects and so on. That's how we use them. God has a use for them as well, even though they're evil. They have a purpose. Okay? I mean, what would the... What would the mice population, the rat population, be like if there were no snakes? Be out of this world. Crazy, right? So do snakes serve a purpose? Sure they And snakes eat other snakes. And that in itself is a picture of Satan's kingdom. It will eventually devour itself. Yeah, amen. So, in Revelation 12, the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out in the earth and his angels are cast out with him. Here, he's a dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan. How many titles? One, two, three, four. Four names, four titles. It's the same, but he is a beast. He's intelligent. Ezekiel 28 tells us, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. But then later on, Ezekiel 28, it tells us that his wisdom was corrupted by his pride in his appearance, his beauty. It was corrupted. So he has gone into a fallen state. He remains in a fallen state and he will never, ever, ever convert. He will never change. He will never say, I'm sorry. He will never stop being evil. He has to be destroyed. And that's what he was made for. Um, where is that? Is that Second Peter or Jude? These is natural brute beast made to be taken and destroyed. Yeah, I looked right at it. Second Peter chapter 12. Turn there very quickly. Oh, wow. Bible puts it all together here. Second Peter chapter 2 is a teaching about false prophets. Um... The people, Sterling, that we're worried about in this country, that are stirring up all this hatred, this strife, this division, trying to start a, they're trying to pick a fight. Do you think they're going to be reasoned with? I think maybe some might be, but the hardcore leaders. Mm -mm. 
They, have, they, are, they are so sold out on their cause. This is why they're still doing it. They haven't given up. They haven't stopped. How long has this been going on now? A month? At least. So look at Re uh, 2 Peter 2. Look at verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise what? Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They want what they want. They are not afraid to speak evil of trumpeties. <laughs> Dignities. Look at verse 11. He's going to equate them now with these angels. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Verse 12. But these as natural what? Brute beasts. Made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they... That's the guy this morning that we saw. He speaks evil of the God that he doesn't understand and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. You know, this is what's interesting. There is a symbol that's used in secret societies. It's used in the New Age. It's used in the occult. And it's the emblem of a serpent swallowing its own tail. Now they say, he's, he laughed at that. And I get his laughter. Because he knows, he gets it. What it means is they're consuming themselves, right? But you know what they say? They say that is a powerful sign of resurrection, new life, new start, new beginning. No, it isn't. Even their very symbolism is they're going to destroy themselves. And it's cool. These as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they understand not, shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot when? In the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. Notice that phrase, cannot cease from sin, Joe. They could no more stop their own actions than a dog. They can't do it. They cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and beguiling young college students. My mom noticed that when I left home and went to Bible college that I had changed. Just Bible college. She didn't like the change she saw, she saw in her little boy. And that was Bible college. I was talking to Sister Pam earlier about a friend that I grew up with. He went to Second Baptist. I came here. We were in church three times, four times a week, every service. Knew the Bible front and back. He and I were almost identical in everything that we believed. We played the same kind of music. I mean, we read the same kind of books. We did everything together. He goes to a state school down in Arkansas. I go to Bible college. And by the second semester, I called him just to see how my buddy was doing. And he said he was taking a philosophy course. And he said, I'm pretty sure I don't believe in God anymore. That was less than one year into his first year in college. They had already driven that out of him. And to this day, I don't think he's overcome that. To this day, I don't think he has. So that's what ha they beguile unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children which have forsaken the right way. And I could go on reading. But now we're talking about people who have a beast nature in them. And that's a spirit. Where's the spirit that leads us? Leads us to righteousness. Leads us to logical thinking. Leads, leads us to understanding we have a choice, a free will. And that we, if we choose right, there's reward. If we choose wrong, there's, there's going to be a punishment for that. We choose the right things because the spirit leads us that. But their spirit is a beast spirit. And you can't reason and argue with a dog. You can't reason and argue with a lion that's going to eat you. You can't reason with a snake to tell him to not bite you. You're an important person. They don't understand it and they never, ever will. Okay? Uh, James, look at James 4, 7 up on the screen. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So think now think about this. And it, turn to Luke chapter 4 very quickly. Take you on a little course here. Teaching you this is spiritual kingdoms 101. 
This is how the spirit world works. So, are devils afraid of just humans? No. They are more powerful than we are. They can, we can't even see them. They can appear and disappear at will. They have powers that we don't have. They have higher thinking and able to see things that we can't see. And by the very nature, because we have been made lower than them, they're not afraid of us. But there is someone they are very afraid of. He is the man, Christ Jesus. So, in Luke chapter 4, the devil is trying to tempt Jesus. He's 40 days hungered. Verse 3, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil takes him, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And I believe that was all kingdoms, past, present, future. In all of time, in a moment of time. All this power, verse 6, will I give thee in the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me, and to whom, whosoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So verse 9, he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, that thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, she shall give his angels charge. See, he knows the Bible, doesn't he? He knows it. He just doesn't believe it. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now watch this. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Jesus resisted and the devil fled. See how it works? So, these devils, I've had them on me. I've had them trying to chase me out. Talk me into all kinds of just get me out of the way stuff. And they're not afraid of me. I, by my nature, get afraid of them. When, you, when you're hearing the voices, get out, get out, leave, go, get out of here. You better, get, you better leave, you're in danger. When you're hearing that in your mind, in your heart, it's vexing. It drives you. It compels you. Until Jesus shows up on the scene. And I have seen literally where instantaneously, all of a sudden, the spirit, I could tell the spirit had left. I could sense that it was gone. The heaviness, whatever, however you describe it. It's all of a sudden a different thing. Why? Because you withstood God strengthened you. Jesus appeared. You couldn't see him, but they could. And they knew who he was. They were afraid of him. So look and uh, put this up on the screen. You can look there very quickly. Just to move on, Mark 1, 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Think about when the Israelites decided to make a God in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai, what image was that God? A calf, not a man. Not an old man with a white beard on a throne with lightning bolt in his hand. It was a beast they made. So this man had an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, let us alone. What if we, what, this is a multiple spirit. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? They knew who he was and they knew what power he had. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried with a loud voice and came out of him. Did he have a choice? No. 
It's just like a man who trains an animal. And when he whistles or snaps his fingers or he gives a word, cops with police dogs. Police dogs are trained usually in German so that American thieves and thugs and killers don't order the dog to do something because they don't know the words. This cop is given words that that dog understands. When that cop, I've seen him, when that cop says whatever he says, all of a sudden that dog sits down. It, even though he wants to tear into that guy, that dog will sit right down. And you can see it, his tail's wagging, his hackles are up, he's wanting it. But he sits down, why? Because his master told him to. Amen. Look at Matthew 8, 28. When he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. This is a different story than the Gadarenes, because there was only one. Coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass that way. See, they're not afraid of men. They're not afraid of people. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? The man whose picture I put up on the screen this morning, he may not know who Jesus is, but the spirits that are in him does. And that's, I want you to think about this. That's why they're using this man to try to destroy as many of us Christians as possible. Why? Because when we show up, who shows up with us? Jesus. And they can't stand that. And it makes them ballistic. Luke 4, 36. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And Jesus didn't use any magic words. He didn't sprinkle holy water on them and no many patrity of Eliot, spiritual song. He didn't do anything like that. He said, get out. Boom. They're gone. Why? Because God put it in their nature to be afraid of the man, Jesus Christ. So, Psalm 22, turn there and we'll... I'm not quite done with that, but I'll... We'll look at it in a little bit different sight next Sunday night. Psalm 22. Uh, what is Psalm 22? Does anybody know what that is about? Christ and the crucifixion. And understand, David lived a thousand years before Jesus. So if we were to go back a thousand years, what are we talking about? The year 1020 A.D. So let's say in a library in England, a book was discovered where a guy had written about a man named Michael Hoggard. Describe the day I was born, the my name of my parents, what I did when I was 12, what I did when I was 30 years old, how I spent my life, things that I said, things that I did, things that a thousand years ago, there's no way anybody could have known that. They discovered that book, and I'm reading it, and I'm going, that exact thing, I'm just going, ooh, that's freaky, right? That's what you're looking at. Jesus not only quoted the very words at the beginning of Psalm 22, which some might say, well, he knew the prophecy, so he self-fulfilled it by speaking those words. Okay, but who nailed him to the cross? Who parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture? He didn't make the guys do that. They did that on their own. And that was written in Psalm 22. My God, my God, verse 1, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? If you look in verse... Um, Six, but I'm a worm and no man of reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that see me to laugh me to scorn and they shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. That's what they said of Jesus on the cross. And then look at now verse 12. When you read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 
You remember how the gospel stories, when Jesus is on the cross and they described all the bulls that were down at the base of the cross on Mount Golgotha? Remember that part? It ain't there. There were no bulls wandering around Golgotha. So look at verse 12. Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. What kind of bulls? Spirits. Gods. Devils. Were there at Golgotha. And they had surrounded Christ waiting for him to die. Because they thought if he dies, we get it all. Then he said, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Now we have lions there. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Now we have dogs for dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. That was written a thousand years. And of course, the devils probably have read that. They just don't get it. They don't see it. They don't understand why is it that the devil was so bent on trying to crucify Jesus? He's supposed to be smart, right? And yet, you know, I, I've asked this question. Are the things animals cannot see? They can't see orange. Deer can't see orange, right? Did I ask them? No, I asked my daddy and my daddy said they couldn't see it. Dogs can't see certain colors, but I do believe dogs can see spirits. Oh, yeah. These dogs compass Jesus, and it's like they think if we kill him, then we can have the inheritance. We can have heaven. We'll take over because God will be dead now, and we will have won. And these are all devils surrounding Jesus on the cross, waiting for him to die. Beasts. Can you imagine when Jesus said, it is finished, the screams of hell sounding throughout all the universe. And yet, he rose from the dead. He didn't even corrupt three days in the tomb. He didn't smell. None of his body had wasted nothing because God does not allow his Holy One to see corruption. Amen. Amen. So you understand now, devils are only afraid of one thing. And they're very afraid of one thing, Jesus. So let's say things are going to get really bad by November. Who's going to be with us? And since all of this is spiritual, see it that way. See it that way. Okay? So study, study these devils. Study these animals in the Bible. And why are they all sacrificed? Why are they all thrown into fire? Think about that, because that's going to happen. Amen?